it, yeah, I think one of the, the first things, of course, to think about are, are, are hazards and, uh, and their impacts on, on communities. Uh, this is an area which, you know, you know I'm, as a party politician, one feels very responsible for that. And, and uh, Malaysia has experienced its fair share of, of events of that sort. But what is very impressive, uh, we had a presentation from the uh, Malaysian government scientific advisor in, in, in London in, in, in November, you know, is the way in which uh, uh, M M Malaysia has, has dealt with these issues of floods in, in quite tightly built communities by, for example, by using all the materials that uh, have been obtained, uh, 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 sort of, uh, brought together and then re reformed in the um, <coughs> following the disasters. Um, and um, so I think the use of materials, uh, local materials, is one in which local science and technologists can make unique contributions and special contributions. Um, I mean, in the UK, we've been also having floods, and what's been all depressing is that people then rebuilt buildings in the old way. Um, and when there's more floods, then there, 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 there's a couple of technology is not very good. So I, I think that's that's one thing, and obviously we shall hear, hear about palm oil, but, but it, Malaysia does seem to have understood what the scientific technical questions are, uh, and have methods in government and in industry and universities to focus on those, and I think uh, um, that's the first area where it seems to me the government uh, is, is rightly focusing. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And I must uh, make a disclaimer that I'm not uh, in any way close to being an expert in climate change issues. But I do support efforts to uh, send my so-called scientists to COP21 meeting and things like that at our own cost. So that, I think, is a start. Uh, what I feel is useful is that uh, on the ground, whether you're talking about industry or business, uh, just give a quick example. We notice there is a very severe drought impacting on our agriculture crops. So as scientists, what do we do? What the plants want would be more water, otherwise the yield will uh, be impacted. So we actually have to find the most efficient, sustainable way to irrigate what was not irrigated before. For example, as already mentioned, oil palm. Nobody would think that you need to irrigate oil palm in Malaysia because we have so much of rainfall. But a scientific evaluation would quickly determine that the rainfall is not evenly distributed. Three, four months of drought will impact the yield and make us less competitive. But then it is costly to irrigate. That is the layman's assessment. But if we apply science properly, irrigation costs can be reduced to such a low level that it makes sense to increase your yield pay for the cost of installing irrigation and then, you know, get on with the business, you know, making more profit and at no expense to climate change or whatever other uh, environmental issues that may be of consideration. So these are examples of how we have to utilize science, perhaps, you know, in coping with the transform, uh, or, or transforming weather pattern or climate pattern, that we have to, to use our scientific knowledge to adjust and still get on with business. And of course, if we value the amount of money or revenue to be gained, if you can increase the, double the yield of the oil palm industry in Malaysia, and, Mantra and, and all this, it's like uh, immediately uh, 20 billion more revenue, uh, you know, within let's say five years once you install your facilities. So there's plenty of opportunities to do business, even linking this to the concept of, you know, managing climate change. Just, just that. But I have other aspects to discuss. I think uh, we have a very good system. Uh, of agriculture here and in the preliminary coffee uh, discussion uh, there was some misconception that deforestation may be uh, you know uh,
causing a lot of issues on climate change, and this could be linked to palm. But I can tell you, oil palm takes very little land area of the world. 0.03% of world agricultural land is occupied by oil palm. And if you want to know what other industries are causing, uh, you know, global emission due to farming, deforestation, it's livestock industry. 3.5 billion hectares compared to our 0.3 percent, which is about 15 million hectares of oil palm. So again, the disproportionate burdening of oil palm in terms of perception is actually uh, having a, 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 a countering, counterproductive effect. In other words, oil palm is a plant species, a forest species that we cultivate. It's just like your wind farm. While it's producing free energy, it is also capturing CO2. That's what oil palm is supposed to do. <laughs> but the wind farm will not be able to capture CO2 on its own because it's made of steel. Uh, but this oil palm tree is actually a forest species that can actually sequester carbon dioxide while it is producing free energy, not only for biodiesel or for other purposes, it's biomass free energy and food kind of free energy. So it's a wonderful thing to have. And uh, when you talk about the individual carbon uh, emission load, as Prof Han was, uh, uh, was trying, if you look at Indonesia, I remember President Obama trying to lecture the Indonesian about reducing carbon emission. And I checked the internet, it is 1.8 tons per Indonesian, one person. Whereas the US is about 17, 18 tons, 10 times more per person. And, the, and Obama had the audacity to lecture the Indonesians to reduce their individual carbon you know, emission. So things like that may not make me happy. So I write a lot on the tweet in the internet. So uh, this is the way that we respond. Thank you. That was the uh, first round of questions. But uh, I think, uh, thank you for clearing up uh, the uh, issue of deforestation and what damage uh, deforestation We're going to be focusing on that uh, You know. I mean, the issue of desert, the desert, desertification is even larger, you know, the, the scale of it. So that's a very good point that you've raised. But can I just focus the, the discussion by the panel towards what kind of strategic investment, uh, basically you want to translate the, uh, the Paris Agreement. We know the, uh, the signs of it. We've agreed that uh, there, will, there are policy issues. Uh, but since this is a program organized by the Academy of Science, we want to focus on how we can actually focus strategic investments from the country, from the corporations, from the businesses uh, towards reducing uh, our carbon emission in terms of using science and technology. So we're going to be very focused in terms of that. Now perhaps uh, you have mentioned the use of local materials right, in, in dealing with, uh, and you have also mentioned, uh, uh, Julian, about the good work that our scientists in Malaysia are, are, are actually doing. Uh, very interesting, you point to the fact that uh, the work that you're doing with the network, the Asian network, and the, the data, the scientific data, all of that actually is, uh, should be published in our, you know, in the, instead of this nature and so on. Um, perhaps you can relate what is happening outside, yeah? the Asian region, because you t tend to have a very uh, approach that says that each each part of the world will require different solutions, therefore different kind of science and technology. Would it be right to say that is what you are advocating? There are some, of course, there will be universal technology. Well, I mean, that there are some very basic, you know, things Newton's law and Newton's law. Um, but there are, uh, you know, subtle things about the nature of clouds, or um, certainly the nature of how plants and plants relate to soil types. These are very specific. Um, so my my point really is obviously if you're going to find a variation on Newton's law, you should publish that in the best journals in the world. But if you're going to talk about uh, microbes in particular soils, you might as well talk about that. Too. In the local area, so it's you know it is a broad thing, and of course you know I, I should I should hesitate I should I should 
I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, there are scientific groups in high latitudes, you know, who are very, very committed to, for example, solving the question of disease in, in all, all over the world. Right? University College is next to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and they're very, very interested in, in the health aspects of cities and, uh, and, and these new, new viruses and so on. Um, so, but I just think it should, it, 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 well, it needs a balance in, this, in, in, in how this is done. Um, and, um, and obviously it's also very important that, that, that scientists, you know, so working here in, in, in Malaysia and it's, it's Southeast Asia needs also to travel to other, to other, to other, to other countries. Um, but, you know, it, it is a question of trying to make a different concept. And other cities, you see, cities are very different. The way they are, Developing cities in Indonesia and, and, and uh, India and China is very different. Um, I mean, the British city is, is assumed that the wind blows, it sort of takes the air pollution from one end and blows it across the other end. Look at, look at London, all the graphs, that's what happens. And it doesn't happen like that in China or in, 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 in Indonesia because it's driven by all these sort of, sort of heating plumes. Um, and therefore, and the, and the pollution is so great, people don't want to sort of travel in this way. They want to travel uh, and, and, and live and work very close to each other, localized communities. So there's some very interesting and big differences. In, um, but I'll tell you one interesting thing is that I was very interested when I moved from Cambridge, where I'd been city councillor in a small city, uh, and I introduced pedestrianisation. It was just a revolutionary idea in 1972. Then I moved to London. And I said, there's no book on the environment of London. So we did a conference, we published a book. Now, you know that there is no book written on the environment of most cities around the world. There's no book on the environment of Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Beijing. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. You will have technical articles. So one of the things about scientists or academics uh, is they must have integrated approach. Uh, and that's the, the concept of holism integration is a very important aspect, a growing aspect of science, because we don't bring all these things together. Thank you. Uh, perhaps, Tansri, uh, you raised the issue of uh, land use. And land use, of course, uh, clearing of land is an issue related to... Now, what kind of technology would you like to see in place you know, in terms of our agriculture? I know the climate change is going to be a threat to definitely our food security, you know, the land that we have growing food, growing palm and so on. So what kind of technology would you be looking at, uh, you know, in terms of as a palm oil person? Uh, and also in agriculture, what, what kind of uh, you can, technology would you be seeing? Um, okay, we, we, when we look at uh, the development of agriculture it is having a long history. Uh, it is associated that agriculture is linked to deforestation. The more agriculture you have, the more you must have uh, deforested before. So uh, what technology would help to reduce uh, deforestation or to reduce agriculture? I don't think that is really the question. Agriculture is all about food security, food self-sufficiency. Uh, you can make a selection that if you want less damage or less deforestation, you choose a more productive crop. And the technology nowadays in the oil and fat sector is exactly oil palm. If you plant oil palm, you need 10 times less rain than if you were to produce your oil by planting soybean seed, corn, or whatever. If you want biofuel, the same thing. Yes, biofuel will help reduce climate change impact uh, because of you know, that uh, idea that uh, biofuel is renewable. But again, the West has accustomed themselves to thinking that soya is the best biofuel, which is not true. It gobbles up so much land that in it itself is not uh, more or less approved in the EU as a suitable biofuel according to the EU standard. Of course, this political EU says uh, it's rapeseed, not so, uh, so soya. But palm being the kind of residual uh, supplement of the supply, 
is neglected, but actually it's the farm that has got the right technology to overcome deforestation in the, into the future as we need more source of fuel, uh, I mean food as well as fuel, uh, to feed the growing world population, which is a must. So, farm has the answer, but nobody wants to use it or believe in it, uh, because perhaps we have been damaged by a lot of uh, misinformation campaign against it and things like that. But that is okay, as long as we are doing the right thing. Farm is uh, highly uh, sustainable technologically, we have only done a one cycle of breeding program. I mean, those scientists would know rice has probably gone 200 cycle of breeding program, so is wheat and so on. But our farm has, one, has got one or two. There's a lot more. You can double the yield of the oil palm from what it is today, four tons to eight tons. And suddenly, with the oil palm, you can think of being able to fuel the Volkswagen Polo car uh, a total of 400,000 kilometers on a per hectare of farm-based fuel in combination with biogas and, and so on. Whereas with soya you get less than 10,000 hectares. There's a big difference between 4,000 hectares and 400,000, sorry, 4,000 kilometers of journey of a Polo car fueled by soya per hectare compared to 400,000 kilometers fueled by palm on a per hectare basis. So, I mean, the world is not yet ready to face this reality or this to seize this opportunity, but the technology is there. We have sequenced the oil palm uh, in terms of genomic sequencing to understand more and more what it can do in terms of uh, enhancing yield, being uh, less prone to droughts in the future and things like that. So if you're talking about biotechnology or technology using, using uh, plants and so on to prepare for your future, oil palm is okay. But Malaysia, we are lucky in the sense that we are still, I think, a net uh, remover of CO2 as a country, except for the fossil fuel that we are using and burning so fast, like all other countries, that we are net emitter now, simply because of the biofuel that we are using to power our general electricity plant and, and cars and everything, just like other countries are doing. But if you remove the bio, uh, fossil fuel component from our economy, the rest of the economy, we could keep 60% for us, and another 20 or so percent of plantation trees or forests like oil palm and rubber, we are net remover of CO2 as a country. And so that is rarely, uh, let's say, the case for other countries in the world. So we have time and we should actually exploit our opportunity here to bring in better and better technologies to keep us well ahead of the curve in terms of not being a major emitter. Uh, and that means we have to gradually look at how other countries are able to replace their fossil fuel towards more carbon uh, efficient fuel into the future, just like other countries are doing. But we have a good head start because we are not really, you know, uh, emitting in the other department or areas uh, of concern. Only in the fossil fuel area we are emitting perhaps as, as good or as much as some of the mid-income countries of the world. But we have this other uh, large size forest that we keep, committed to keep and so on, that is naturally acting as our carbon sequestration uh, facility. So I hope, uh, you know, from now and in, in the next uh, so-called COP21, whatever, we should be able to deliver our targets. You know, because it's easy to deliver our targets that we have jointly committed after the Paris conference. Okay, thank you, Tai uh, For the audience, actually, MBOP has a chair at the University of Bangsa Malaysia. We call it the MBOP chair, UKM. So, from what you said, uh, in terms of the yield, the productivity of uh, and the technology, it seems that uh, we have made right moves in terms of investing in a lot of this research for yield of palm oil, for better 
uh, you know, technology in terms of zero waste emission in the palm oil industry. I know Simda we works uh, very hard as well on that issue of zero to earth, uh, zero to air. Uh, so we have always kept the, our competitive edge in terms of the industry, yet not, hard, try, not harming the, uh, the uh, climate. And, uh, and all this is due to investment in science and technology. Uh, so definitely there should be more investment uh, and also to look at all these grand challenges that are ahead of us. Now, perhaps this is a good time for me to take questions uh, from the audience. I know I've seen, I can see several hands up there. One, two, okay, we have two. Please go to the microphone, introduce yourselves, and then address your question to the panel. Um, Can you just introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, my name is uh, Lopak Sam. I'm a fellow of Academy of Science. Yeah. And I would, I would love to hear more about the strategic investment uh, with relation to Malaysia, how Malaysia should do better uh, after COP21 and maybe in the longer term. We all know that this COP meetings, uh, this agreement, that is a global meeting. Some of the some of the conclusions may not be actually applicable to Malaysia. For example, they all talk about two degrees C increase should not be more than two degrees C, or aiming to go to down to one point five degrees C. How do we know that this two degrees C or even one point five degrees C is actually applicable to Malaysia? It's a global average. So we need more local investment in science, more investment in local science. I think this is the point I want to highlight here. We do not know enough about climate change impact on our agriculture, on our rainfall pattern, maybe on our... Uh, we, we do have typhoons much here. Maybe in the future, perhaps a typhoon threat may even move down to Malaysia, say from Philippines or from Vietnam. You know, these are the things we do not know. We do not know how climate change influence our El Nino, you know, which impacts on less of drought at the moment, you know, or La Lina, you know, so these are unknown, you know. We so much rely on IPCC, which is very much a global assessment of science. You know, they have this IPCC assessment panels. We don't have a local assessment panel. We should have our own local assessment panels. Assessment our own local science, publish our own local science, whether it's local journals or international journals. So that we have a better picture about what's happening of climate change on Malaysia. On the other hand, how Malaysia can contribute you know, to the global target. You know, they are both very traffic. You know, mitigation and adaptation are both sort of supportive to each other. So this is the thing I, I really want to highlight. We must invest more in our local science, climate science, so that we know more about the situation in Malaysia. So this is the first point I want to make. Second point I want to make about, about this uh, global agreement, so often it's a political agreement. In fact, this uh, two degree C is very much a political decision. It is not a scientific decision today. I don't think IPCC has ever come up with this two degree C sort of as a criterion to assess that it's the dangerous climate change. If you go above 20, two degree C, below the, and then below two degree C, you will be safe. No, I don't think IPCC has ever said such, made such a statement. It is very much a political decision, I think, at Copenhagen. Copenhagen 2009. Copenhagen Accord was not even adopted by the party at the time. So for those who follow the climate change negotiation, we all know Copenhagen Accord is not formally adopted by the Copenhagen of the party at Copenhagen of that year, 2009. So, so of course, you know, things move on after Copenhagen. I think there is the 2005. Thank you. Okay. Can I take uh, the yeah, next two questions? Um, hello, my name is Karen Lim. I'm a chartered town planner. Um, I also studied, I studied a certificate in climate change in Australia, chartered town planning, planning Institute of Australia. My question about climate change is that with climate change, there is a, um, with the um, reporting by DOE on the haze in Malaysia, the 
DOE had only reports on PM10 particulates, whereas the thing that is of concern is actually the PM2.5. It's actually finding dust particulates that actually um, sinks down into a person's lungs and um, causes a person who has asthma to have difficulty in breathing and um, could have long-term damage on their health. So I was wondering what can the Department of Environment do to actually build up measuring stations to measure PM2.5 particulates rather than just reporting on um, PM2, um, PM10. The other thing I wanted to, um, it, to ask about was why is Malaysia's reporting of the PM, um, when there is haze, the reporting of the um, API is done, I think, 12 hourly, but in Singapore it's done 3 hourly. Why can it not be reported more frequently so that people can better understand what kind of um, climatic conditions they're going to change when they want to exit their home during a haze alert scenario? Okay, thank, thank you. you I think that's, uh, we'll, we'll begin this, this <coughs> uh, Karen's question actually, uh, our Dr. Gary is not here, he's from the Natural Resource and Environment. He will probably be best to, best person to actually talk about that. Uh, so that is not directly related to what we have been discussing, but perhaps if any of the panel experts would like to talk about it, uh, please. Now the other question, so one is on the particular, and when you address this, you can address it in, in any order. And uh, of, of course, the strategic investment in science and technology that Malaysia should be making or making more of, uh, and then the local factor yeah, in terms of some of the IPCC's funding. And the issue of question about whether COP21 is a political agreement. Again, please comment. Can we start with uh, Julian, perhaps? Well, the, the, so the common theme of these two questions um, is the, question, is, is the question of data, exchange of data, and the openness of data. Um, as I say, I, I was head of the British Met Office uh, in the 90s, and there was a, a big debate for place then as to whether we would move much further forward in exchanging uh, all kinds of data uh, more openly than before. There was a very, very, very base level uh, was agreed before that. Um, but I, I think that, uh, so, so, for example, in, in terms of in terms of weather, I mean, the, the, your Met Office in Malaysia, our Met Office in the UK, other Met Offices, uh, they they now have greatly improved, greatly improved the amount of data that they take. There are many more instruments. I mean, I, I was hearing at lunch today about uh, the Malaysian Met Office uh, is measuring data rainfall in much more detail all over all over. Malaya, in, in order in order to understand these complex trends that uh, you were back to the question are asked about about uh, their variability in monsoon El Nino and so on. So the way to understand those is to keep looking at local data impacts. Um, and I think the, the uh, there's a great deal of integrity uh, 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 in scientific organisations and scientists themselves in uh, openness of, of this data. And so I, there was a sort of hint in your question about the, the final results being rather political. Um, I mean, I was, I was at, Co partly, you know, at Copenhagen, in fact, it was because of my conversations there, I made the point this afternoon that, the, that the, some, some of the politicians and were very conscious that uh, some politicians, that, that other politicians were deprecating the data or not understanding it because they say, well, if the graph was going up this way and it's suddenly going flat, that means you don't have to worry. So, so scientists have to really uh, look at the agreed data and then try and explain that in a sensible way. But as you say, there are factors we don't know. Can I just comment about air pollution? Air pollution um, is subject of great interest to me. My, my, my wife has asthma. Um, one of the reasons I was very interested in, in a small city of Cambridge you know, was to reduce it was first of all measure the air pollution concentrations and then stop the cars there and then noticing the you know, the air pollution went down. Uh, and everybody has seen this kind of thing all over the world. But um, you have complex uh, situations such as particularly here where you've got haze from the burning uh, of forests and agriculture. 
in, in conjunction with uh, very considerable amounts of particulates from shipping, in conjunction with people living in houses with air conditioning so that uh, um, diseases or, or bacteria can spread. Um, in fact, Singapore is a country which has some of the highest childhood asthma in the world because of this combination of, of, of processes. And the, the way in which we, we, we ventilate our houses uh, is a very critical feature. And there's a lot, of, a lot of work going on about that. So I think all the questions that were raised were, were quite right. Um, and I, I don't recognize, um, speaking both as a scientist or a politician, much uh, as it were deliberate obfuscation. It all seems to be we're dealing with great, great problems, problems and we're being as open as we can be. I was uh, persuaded to try and answer the particle uh, issue as well, but I'm not in any way in touch what I read and as scientists, we can interpret what we read, the explanation given. One is, it is still pertaining to internationally accepted uh, standards to use the 10 uh, microns or whatever size that you mentioned. Singapore is having a special one, and that is their kind of uh, take about what they should be doing. Uh, but as long as uh, Malaysia is uh, adopting an internationally accepted practice, that is perhaps the reason why they stick to this. And second, uh, Malaysia is not like Singapore. We have to cover Sabah and Sarawak. And a lot of these are rural areas. And to put monitoring equipment uh, all over at such refined uh, level of uh, particle size is also a practical issue, of course, as well as capability to report well. So again, this has been explained in the press. I, I hope uh, this is uh, something that the Ministry of Rural Natural Resources would be able to give you a, a better answer, I believe. Uh, being practical. On the uh, strategic investment, sorry, climate science, uh, scientific uh, research needed uh, for Malaysia, I think this is uh, something that academic science and so on must continue to uh, push for its uh, development uh, because this issue is not going to go away. This issue is going to get more intensive, whether you believe in climate change or not. Uh, just because the pressure of the world, you know, population, 100 million more people coming into the world every year, 9 billion by 2043. Uh, from compared to seven over billion now of world population. All these will create the, the, the pollutants that you want, the emissions that you want. I used to calculate just to, you know, uh, entertain the Twitter uh, discussion. You know, 10 cars uh, in their lifetime of 15 years, as an example, would emit as much CO2 as deforestation of one hectare of land or tropical forest. You know, but Europe is giving new uh, a million new cars a year. And, you know, every ten cars is equivalent to emission of uh, one hectare of deforestation. Are we going to give up deforestation? Yes, in Malaysia we are uh, because we have uh, more than like exhausted areas where we can deforest for agriculture. But are we going to give up cars? In that sense, you know. I don't think so. In the near future, we will still continue. Yes, we may have hybrid cars or you know better fuel cars, but still, economic activities depending on fossil fuel will continue. I believe. So, the issue of uh, if you believe in global greenhouse uh, warming effect of all these emissions, then the scientific community among us, pertaining to what would be anticipated for Malaysia, must develop the capability and capacity to do more research, to advise the government, things like that. Exactly what our academy science is set up to do. So I'm all supportive of uh, a way in which we can put even more resources uh, to prepare for the future. We have already got our 50-year uh, forecast of what is to be looked into, like in the mega science outlook that we have already started. And this could be part of it as well.
Thank you, Tan Sri. Uh, let me welcome the third member of our panel on the stage, uh, Dr. Gary William Tessera, uh, Deputy Under Secretary at the Environment uh, Ministry of Nat Nat Natural Resources and Environment. He's at the Environmental Management and Climate Change Division. Um, just now there was a question with regards to Malaysia's uh, monitoring of uh, PM10, PM2.5. Would you like to address that? Uh, Karen, would you like to ask the question again? Yes, my question was about the haze and its impact on people's health. Um, I understand that Malaysia report on PM10, which is actually quite a large construction material particles, which is very, but that's even visible to the eye. But with regards to PM2.5, it's very fine particles that's almost invisible eye, right? and that actually is not able to be filtered by our body, actually um, sinks into our lungs and um, create health problems, much more effective on me. So that there's a haze problem, I can't go out because I can't breathe. So what can be done um, to improve the monitoring and reporting of the to my problem? Thank you very much for the question and uh, to our distinguished guests here. My apologies for coming late. I actually came from a uh, discussion on IK, ICAO's uh, global setting scheme for airlines. So as you can see, the, the issue really is at the surface and the, at the cutting edge now of interest in, in the country. Uh, essentially, uh, the ministry has begun shifting over from PM10 to PM2.5. Uh, it's just that not all of our monitoring stations have been converted yet. And so as a result, when we put the results on, on the web page in real time, uh, we, we will not be able to identify which are which. Uh, as you might guess, the, the haze does consist of a mix of particles, but many of the particles are actually quite huge, which is why the haze is, is so visible to us. Uh, in addressing the haze, of course, there are a number of different avenues. Uh, there's, a, there's, of course, bilateral relations between us and, and Indonesia, uh, multilateral with Singapore as well. But the, the issue really is one of engagement and empowerment. Uh, and uh, this, this problem will not be solved. Because what we're, what we're trying to do, essentially, is we're trying to ask a person who is used to controlling pests, and uh, uh, which means animals, animal pests, insects, as well as weed pests, we're asking them to, to compare one matchstick in about five seconds to a comprehensive integrated pest management system involving safety equipment, uh, uh, pesticides, lockout periods, and the like. So it will take uh, education, it will take coordination, engagement uh, of the uh, uh, entities that do have access to these, the plantations might have access to herbicides, pesticides, know about lockout periods, uh, boots, rubber gloves, respirators, and they might also uh, need to allow the people who would normally use that one match and be able to go straight to work in plantation to actually use the equipment safely and responsibly in such a way that then uh, allows them time later on to go back to the plantations and work. So it's a, it's a very complicated problem and it's going to require uh, a very uh, broad-based solution. Uh, I think that between these two uh, means, we should be able to, to, to address uh, the haze problem uh, systematically in the next five to ten years. Thank you. Okay, perhaps we'll have our second round of questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Prof. Maslan, and anyone else, just raise your hands. Adri, okay, please. Go. Thank you, everyone. I'm Mazda Akran from the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. This question is to Lord Hunt. Now, in one of the analysis of the uh, Paris Agreement, it's been said that the transformation for a fossil fuel uh, world would cost us about 1,000 billion per year to the year 2020. Two thirds of that ought to be spent in the developing countries. Now we know that the people with the money are the developed countries, they too have their own climate change problems. What is being done to incentivize their investment in the developing countries? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Audrey Amir. I'm from the Institute for Environment and Development, the Stari UKM. Right, uh, maybe two questions. Eh? Um, one is um, when we talk about uh, strategic investment, actually um, uh, I may direct this question to Tansri and Dr. Gedi uh, as 
that's a key from the government. So what uh, we're pretty much on uh, a clear priorities of the government. Yeah? Of course, um, the, the industry, the palm oil industry, the oil palm industry would demand for, for more um, land. Yeah? I mean, so this is another aspect, important aspect when we talk about climate change, is land use, climate change, yeah? as you see. So what are the demands uh, from the industry and what are the priorities uh, from the government government side? Like uh, um, you want to invest on more land for, for palm oil or, or for oil palm or, or I mean to save um, uh, what, what we have now. Because uh, I mean the question is actually related to a big issue. I think, I think in, the, in the palm oil industry um, 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 group, yeah, maybe last month it was it was a havoc when, when one article was published talking about uh, palm oil uh, encroaching or uh, changing eh, the mangroves of Malaysia. Although although it wasn't entirely true, but but then it actually uh, triggers eh, some some um, issue there. And then secondly, uh, pro, uh, Professor uh, Lord, Lord Julian did mention about atmospheric activities. All right, uh, one important. Uh, aspect that I'm studying is uh, atmospheric activities, uh, lightning strikes activities, yeah, uh, towards the effect yeah, on on mangrove forest regeneration. Okay, higher lightning strikes will will cause uh, will, will create uh, many canopy gaps, and this actually contribute to forest regeneration or forest turnover is either accelerate or slowing down the the, 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 the regeneration of natural forest. So, but then the, the important thing is I found. It, it, it is hard to actually acquire data on lightning strikes in Malaysia. I, I, I could, eh? I, I did my PhD in Australia easily, I can get this data. But in Malaysia, I don't know. So maybe Dr. Gary can guide me on, on getting this data. And then the, the, and the sufficiency of, of data in Malaysia to do research in scientific uh, work. Thank you. One question for Lord Han and uh, directly to, to Lord Han, perhaps you answer that first and then a direct question to uh, the NRE on uh, on how we actually can capture more data or the data source and so on. Okay, perhaps. Well, I mean, the question was very interesting. One about to, about the need um, for, for cutting fossil fuel and uh, and what you, the question you were asking was what kind of investments might be made in developing countries to, um, to help them reduce fossil fuels. Well, the, the, the mechanism um, in, from the UK, um, and, and, the, and the Deputy High Commissioner will give you more details about this, you know, is that uh, the UK spends now 0.7% of its GDP on assistance to developing countries. And I think in a very, very progressive, uh, progressive way, I mean, the substantial part of this of this uh, funding is for use of the developing low carbon energy systems. Um, so whether it's wind power, as I know in, 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 in East Africa, um, agriculture, um, special sort of heating uh, systems uh, in, in villages in India. Uh, so all of those things are, are already happening at quite a, quite a, quite a level. And uh, so from quite small scale to very, very large scale investments. So that's you know, the plan. Uh, at the same time, of course, the UK uh, and other advanced countries are, are uh, funding through the World Bank very, 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 very considerable projects. Um, and I think there's a very good system an open system, which is important, uh, of monitoring what is done. It isn't just kind of some some lump of money with the Union Jack put, put on the front. It, it is to do with with with, with the, uh, investments with the real uh, criteria for that output. And if they don't meet the criteria, then 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 that should be well known. Um, I think that was your question. That's my answer. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh the figure 0.7 percent of the GDP is also an issue, isn't it? Because uh, two thirds of the wealth, or perhaps even more, is that the point is that are the developing country doing in enough to incentivize? So should the 0.7 or perhaps be 2.7 or 3.7? Why stop at 0.7? How do we actually reach this formula? Uh, you know, I, I, in the sense uh, of what, if it is a human, you know, the most important meeting after Adam and Eve, 
If it is so important, surely it deserves uh, more deserves to be done. Uh, more deserves, you know, whoever has the money, regardless, because it's, a, it's, a, it's going to affect all of us. So why not, we, you know, whoever has the most, the most. Well, perhaps I can answer that it's very, in, in, in a way, the world had this very big meeting on sustainable targets. So, so there are objective uh, criteria for what's happening, and the question is whether this investment is sufficient in relation to these kind of agreed international targets. Um, I mean, that's a rational way to proceed, um, and it answers your question. What is the, you said, what is the basis for doing it? That is the basis. Uh, the question is whether that, it, it actually meets that target, and, and we, we should find that out. Right, I'm just reading the devil's head of it, you know, to push it further, but, yep. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, first of all, I, I do need to acknowledge uh, the British government who have, through a number of different facilities, uh, including our Prosperity Fund, Commonwealth Fund, and a number of others, uh, created some avenues for developing countries uh, to access some of this uh, research uh, financing, particularly if it involves any kind of transformative, uh, systematic changes. Now, Malaysia does not qualify for all of these funds. As you know, the uh, Commonwealth Fund, for example, is one we don't qualify for. But uh, nevertheless, uh, going to the question, I guess the, the, the idea really is that, that um, the emissions reduction or the emissions management plan for Malaysia really hinges quite strongly on the fact that we do not want to lose any more of the forest than we already have. It's, it's uh, difficult to make the forest grow and sequester more than it already does. Uh, you, know, you, you drop fertilizer on it, but then fertilize it in nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas with a higher uh, more potential than CO2, so you know, don't, don't waste your time. The idea really is to keep the forest that we have while at the same time trying to meet demands for, for food and fuel. Uh, therein lie some of the solutions. It, it really uh, has to be producing increasing amounts of food and fuel uh, on the same amount of land. And to do it in a way that does not also increase emissions. Uh, we already have, to some degree, renewable fuel because we do use methyl acid from oil palm, uh, from palm oil in our diesel. So at least 5% of, of our diesel mix is, is uh, does come from renewable sources. Uh, but then going going to the question on, on um, uh, lightning strikes, I, uh, I have to go back about seven years and, and recall when, when I was working at FRIM, I'm still at FRIM, just a conduit to the ministry. And we did have lightning strikes in FRIM, and, and we lost, the, we do lose a significant number of trees every year to lightning strikes. But the question that becomes one of balance, if you have a tree struck by lightning which dies, gets eaten by termites, that release methane, <laughs> okay? And then you have tree growth in place of that. How much net uh, are you ahead or behind in the game? So uh, it's, it's something of, of a compensatory uh, actions, but uh, of course lightning strikes have, have other uh, effects as well, including nitrogen fixation and the like. So the, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, scientific process, uh, but I'm not sure that we keep track individually of lightning strikes. I just do know that in frame we do lose significant numbers of trees, simply because the trees are the tallest things around in that part of town anyway, uh, to lightning strikes. And I do know that they die and get eaten by, by termites. Uh, yes, we have a canopy gap. Yes, there's regrowth. I'm afraid um, I don't have that data. Thank you. Yeah, actually, the question is on the sufficient, oh, sorry, the sufficiency of data. Uh, not, not, not specifically for the like, yeah, like, like area photograph, for example. We don't have like a good sequence, a complete set of data and, and like in strike for sure. I mean, we don't have access, we don't know where to get data. This is just two examples. Yeah. The, the, the scientific, I will explain. Yeah. But in, in terms of, of the uh, forest, forest gaps, I'm not sure if you would even be able to spot a forest gap with even a sub, sub meter. Besides, when a tree gets struck by lightning, it doesn't die very quickly. It in fact, dies quite slowly. So, so uh, we may talk more about that. We might die if we hit this. Okay, uh, before answering it, Ahmad, Kadir, uh, there's uh, also a question pertaining to uh, our investment strategies, not so much in the science and technology, but in terms of the palm oil, right? And then. Okay, uh, Malaysia has settled down, has developed all the agricultural land that it wants to develop because we have a land uh, resource allocation system, what they call state convertible land has already been fully exhausted 
develop into agriculture. And that brings our agriculture land ratio, land use ratio to 24% of total land area of the country. A very healthy percentage indeed, compared to UK, 72%. You know, their land is under agriculture. We are only 24. And compared to UK, which has 11% forest, we have 65 or 62, pick your figure. So, as far as uh, future uh, deforestation for conversion into agriculture, I don't think a lot more will happen in Malaysia. Uh, and as somebody mentioned, or you mentioned, it will be a case of increasing our productivity. And we've got good uh, strategies around that, how to increase yield of production with the same use of uh, land size under agriculture. Uh, all the mangrove uh, publicity or that, I don't think it is uh, kind of a, a realistic uh, allegation against the palm oil industry. You know, palm oil industry is the only industry that is certified to the RSPO Roundtable on Sustainable Standards and none other oil seeds or most commodities don't do that. We do it as a matter like uh, adopting a religion. So it is safe and stable and moving forward with great, uh, let's say, uh, poise and pride and not to be able to sustain our industry. Uh, and a lot of research going in at the same time to the Malaysian Pump World Board, which I can testify uh, because I was there for a long, long time. So, uh, in that sense, uh, our land use, land use change, Lulu CF, if you like, is not going to uh, be any adverse uh, compared to other countries. In fact, it is our strength, and that's what I've said uh, earlier. So, uh, based on that, yet the palm oil industry as a source of revenue, renewable fuel and renewable fiber has a lot to offer. We are just scratching the surface as far as science exploitation is concerned. And this is because, you see, the oil palm as a tree has got an output-input ratio of 9 to 1, physiologically. You put nine, uh, you put three, one uh, unit of energy, you get nine unit of, of energy out. Other crop is 3 to 1. So we are naturally very efficient energy converter. I used to tell a joke that this is the best solar biological solar panel that not only allows uh, sun energy to be converted into other forms of usable as well as food energy, it is uh, har harnessing a lot of uh, animals as well because the oil palm is a perpetual food chain wherever it is located. See the forest, you may want the forest to be as intact as possible, but it doesn't produce food for the monkeys every day, but the oil palm does. You know how, so wherever there is oil palm, even the orangutans have learned how to live with the oil palm because it provides food for them every day. And you don't have uh, food out of season in the forest. They have to eat leaves and bugs. But oil palm provides all, all kinds of food, uh, so-called, is a very major food chain in the animal kingdom. So please, uh, I mean, this is a, not a campaign, but I have been a bit for some time. It looks like the misinformation going on around the oil palm and palm oil industry is creating unnecessary damage. Whereas, on the other hand, if you will really scientifically assess it, it's a, an ideal uh, product for improving all that you want to improve in terms of climate change. I wonder if I can, I can ask a political question. Last, when I came visiting here a couple of years ago, I went to visit the palace of the king. I was very impressed that the terms of reference of your young Dipotois, Agon, is that he or she uh, must ensure that 50% of Mal Malaysia is covered with forests. So does that include oil oil? No, no, no. So, 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 so it's an even better, uh, better required constitutional requirement. Uh, I then find out that we have a little, we're nothing like as advanced as that in the UK, but uh, in, the, in the Magna Carta, what happens in British government, if the government is saying nothing at all, and MPs have got to talk about something, so they talk about Magna Carta, it's a story. And, and, and um, it turns out that Magna Carta is normally considered a right-wing document, all to do with freedom and uh, you know, laws and so on. Actually, it's a, it's a green document, because it also says you must look after the trees and the ponds and the fish, uh, and uh, so that's also a role uh, that 
right back in the constitution that we have. But you have a much stronger role. If our queen does not have to look after all these forests in England, maybe this should be, we should move in this direction. <laughs> Thank you very much for enlightening us on the values. I'm surprised all the scientists not only have numbers at their fingertips, being a social, you know, a literature expert, I, I do not have all this data. It amazes me. Thanks, Rick. I'm not telling you perhaps the final question because we have to wrap up by. If it's been answered? Uh, I just say that the, the data might be pricing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, it has certainly been a you know, very, very enlightening uh, half an hour, well, half an hour at this time. Data for you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's like in time to side. Now, when you first asked about this particular uh, session on, on strategic investment in science and technology, coming from the university and knowing what has been going on at the university, and I know of the ASEAN Network for Climate, which the uh, University of Cambridge has been working with the uh, University of Pakistan Malaysia and the universities around uh, Asia. Uh, we know of the MPO, we work with UKM and signed up, we work with UKM on various aspects. All of this are uh, actually towards solving a lot of the problems, finding scientific solutions and technological solutions uh, towards helping uh, the country actually uh, work towards climate change goals, you know, the actions, the all climate change related actions. So perhaps, uh, I think the Academy of Science of Malaysia has also been doing a lot of good work in terms of science forecasting and in terms of a grand challenge. The grand challenge, of course, is how to reduce all this, how to best, uh, perhaps, in even in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of uh, alternative energy, in terms of how we do things in agriculture, or food security, all of them have has an impact on our on our, our on our environment. As long as we keep investing in our science and technology to make sure we get better and better at it. With localization, of course, as Lord Han has also mentioned, with enough data and power to analyze this data, including the, the one that you show in Manila, which is actually based on mobile social network, but utilizing big data network analytics analytics. All of these are very important for us to be keep to keep on investing in science and technology. But not just at the university, not just because I come from the university but because I think it really provides the solution. Science and technology and our investment in it should. So if there happens to be people from MOSTI today, any hands from MOSTI? No? Okay, thank you very much. Make sure the Director General keep fighting for